The Spin-Off Podcast Network. This is Kiwi is back for a brand new season with more inspiring kōrero from special guests including amputee, mum and wellbeing advocate Jess Quinn. I'm most confident that I can get through almost anything. It doesn't mean that I nail it every time, but I am very confident I can overcome almost anything. And musician, creative and content creator Taylor Roche. I feel like big dreams always get challenged like all the time, especially when you're doing something that's not traditional. Listen to the new season of This Is Kiwi, brought to you by the Spin-Off Podcast Network in collaboration with Kiwi Bank. Available now wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to Business is Boring, a podcast that reckons it's anything but. Business is Boring is brought to you by Spark Lab, offering inspiration and practical advice to help businesses find their edge. To hear more about Spark Lab, including details about the latest events, workshops, and business tools, visit sparklab.co.nz. And now, here's your host, Simon Pound. Kia ora koutou kato. Welcome to Business is Boring. Anihana is a retail juggernaut. The New Zealand made brand, known for its shampoo bars, bath bombs, and friendly, fun, sustainable packaging, is on a mission to deliver 100 million smiles for people and planet through selling products better for the earth and by delivering lovely moments for its customers. The brand had a big breakthrough when Walmart DM'd them and asked to stock their products. A kind of retail dream scenario. Founder Sophie Cooper and her team were able to not only scale fast enough to supply thousands of new stores, but to stick the landing and go nationwide with the big retailer. Since then, they've continued to grow so fast, they're currently doing a capital raise through Snowball Effect to service demand and growth. To talk the journey, being one of the most successful FMCG exports out of Aotearoa, and what's next, Sophie Cooper joins us now. Tanakwe, thank you for being here. Kia ora, Simon. Thanks for having me. Hey, so, yeah, tell us about the early journey into Anihana. As you were working as a florist with a soap maker, right? And then next thing you know, tell us about deciding to buy a soap factory while super pregnant. <laughs> yeah, um, sounds crazy, but um, I, so I was a florist for 10 years. Um, I was working for a lady that owned a florist shop and also a soap factory. So I used to sell these beautiful soaps and bath bombs with flowers. Um, and I, I was starting to get a little bit bored of floristry. I was looking at, you know, online courses and, you know, I actually started a a marketing degree. <laughs> um, so I knew I wanted to do something else. Um, I always kind of liked creating beautiful things and making people smile. Um, and then this opportunity came up that my boss wanted to sell her soap factory. Um, and yeah, I went home to my husband. I just happened to be eight months pregnant at the time, about to go on maternity leave. Um, but the opportunity was was too good to pass up. And yeah, a few months later, I had a new business and a new baby. It sounds like, I mean, it's, you know, one little sentence, right? A new business and a new baby. <laughs> but it sounds like a lot. It was a lot. I think I was very naive. I didn't re- kind of realise what both things meant, you know, having a baby for the first time and also trying to figure out how to run a business. Um, it was kind of, we were continued to be like a contract manufacturer at the start. So um, we were just making small batch products for my old boss and still supplying her and other kind of small gift shops in New Zealand. So I really loved being creative and getting to create products for people. So that's what I love to do. Had you always wanted to own kind of a business with lots of moving parts? No. <laughs> no, the opposite, actually. I remember because I, when I was a florist in the UK, I worked for this lady and I could see how stressed she was all the time. And I, I remember going home thinking, who would want to own their own business? Like, it seems so stressful. Um, but I guess I just loved the product so much and I just saw the opportunity. Um, and, it, I mean, it is stressful, but it's a lot of fun too. Being, yeah, like being in a business that makes things like bath bombs and soaps. Like, yeah, what was the opportunity that you saw there? And what did you love about that particular product? 
I think because I got to see the behind the scenes of actually making the product from scratch. So I could see all the good ingredients that went into these products. I could see how different they were to what was on the, you know, the grocery shelves. And I loved how they felt. Um, my kids love, well, they love using them now. Um, and I also got to be creative. So that's what I really loved about it as well. How did you go about launching your own brand? So it wasn't in the plan originally. We, What happened was my boss at the time tried to concentrate on retail. She went to Hong Kong and opened a new store. It didn't work out and ended up, we kind of were like, okay, our revenues kind of dried up. We can't, she was our biggest customer. Um, we don't have this now. What shall we do? So it was like, let's create our own brand um, and our own products. So that's when, you know, we started to create other sustainable products. So started off with soaps and bath bombs, um, which are kind of products that people know. They're generally like, you know, everyone knows what soap is and a bath bomb, but then create products that are waterless and new formulas so shampoo bars conditioner bars um, and that's kind of where we got our break I guess and launching the first shampoo bar into New Zealand grocery um, and that was I guess a really proud moment for me because seeing that on the shelf when you know it's just a sea of plastic being a busy mom and you're in the supermarket so having them accessible for people was something really important for us as well. Yeah what does it take to make a new product like a hard shampoo bar and then to get people to change their behavior to look at them as it's makes a lot of sense right like no water don't pay for the water a lot more sustainable no plastic but it's a really big change from what people have just done forever it is yeah i think i mean it's still today quite challenging to get people to make the switch and once they try it and they love it, it's it's and getting used to the different format. I think it's fine, but when you're used to something, um, it's a lot harder. And there's a lot of education you need to do around why it's better for you and better for the planet. Um, it's I, I can see that it's getting a lot more popular now, which is great. But at the time, it was it was brand new, and you know there was hardly any other brands doing it. Um, so yeah, it's. It's been challenging, but it's definitely worth it, I think, yeah. What year was that, that you were the first into a supermarket? Oh, I'm terrible with dates. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was, so our original brand was called R, A Triple H. Um, that's because, you know, the sound you make when you get in the bath at the end of the day. Um, as a, you know, busy mom, when my baby was asleep, that was kind of what I did to escape and relax. I want to say... 2018. Mm. Yeah. Because that's quite recent, right? Like six years ago. And yeah. it's gone from nothing, that, like there were no soap bars and it wasn't something that really kind of like had a place in the world, to now being like a mainstay, you know, in, in, in retail, which is such a cool thing to have been a part of. And I love the kind of approach you take and that kind of little luxury, like giving people that ah moment, that mm. nice, that nice little pampering thing. Yeah that, you know, a bath bomb uh, or a lovely fragrance and experience in the shower does? Yeah, I think um, we've never kind of tried to be the most sustainable brand on the planet. Like, I kind of see it as our added bonus. Like, we think brands should be doing this kind of thing anyway. Um, I guess, like, our main mission is to create those little moments of joy. You know, solid products don't have to be boring or smell terrible <laughs> um they can still make you feel good and and then at the end of the day you know that you're doing good as well accessibility has been a big part of why it's been a retail superstar right tell us about that approach to making sure people can buy it because there's the change in behavior but also if you're used to spending six bucks on whatever shampoos on special having to fork out for a bar that's got four bottles worth but all at one go that's a big chunk of your grocery bill right yeah I think it's the initial trial period that I think because it is an initial kind of larger purchase at the start but then you know it does last longer so you actually probably end up saving money <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just getting people to try it um, so that's been I guess our biggest challenge um, and like 
you know, our, our star product is our shower steamer, which blows my mind. Um, I'm a bath bomb person. <laughs> um, but these products are by far our best seller. And I think it kind of took off during COVID when everyone was at home. Um, you could buy it in your local pharmacy or supermarket and it's cheaper than a coffee. Um, but you get I guess, to enjoy that benefit for longer and have that kind of spa experience at home. So what, what is a shower steamer? Tell us. This is probably my most asked question yeah. as well. <laughs> um, so I love them now. Every time I go away, I always take them with me. Um, so it's, it's basically a bath bomb, but for your shower. Um, it doesn't touch your skin, so you just put it in the corner of the shower. Uh, the water hits it, slowly dissolves it, and releases... Um, fragrance or essential oils into the steam so it's kind of like an aromatherapy experience um so yeah it's kind of just gives you makes you take some moments to actually just breathe and relax and you know I get lots of moms telling me that they have one a week on Friday for their everything shower and it's like just that special moment you can enjoy to yourself yeah so kind of the the feeling of doing a bit of a ritual of um, self-care and reflection that you would normally have in a bath yeah. without having to put an hour of your day into yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that product there, tell me about that product's role in helping you land Walmart. What happened with Walmart? So we actually launched in Target first. Mm -hmm. um, so they were our first US retailer. Um, that was... I'm not going to say by chance because we actively kind of spoke to a broker there um, and they she, she told us, um, you probably won't get in this time. You're a brand new brand in the US. Just pitch it and she'll remember you for next year. So we were like, okay, we'll do that. Um, and then she loved the product so much. They ended up trialing us in, I think it was 250 stores. Um, and then today we're in... 1200 about to be 1600 target stores so been nearly like, over two years in target now so they've been an amazing partner for us in the US and I think because of that and our, because our packaging is so impactful on shelf it no, we got noticed by other retailers and that's I think that's when Walmart the naturals buyer from Walmart must have seen it and reached out to me via Instagram <laughs> which is crazy didn't know if it was real or not I was like is this the real guy checked him on LinkedIn and it checked out um and he wanted to set up a meeting so I did what I do best and found the right person to deal with that. Um, I'm not a salesperson, so luckily my husband had joined the business full time. Then he's got a heap of experience de dealing with retailers and been in FMCG for I don't know 15, 20 years. Um, so passed it over to him and kind of they set up these regular calls um, to kind of prepare before the actual line review. And he flew over um, and yeah, they wanted to launch 16 SKUs. We we were kind of pitching for like 1,200 stores to 2,000, um, but they ended up taking us in all four, like 4,000 stores, which we were like um, excited, but then like, oh crap, how are we going to do this? <laughs> That's wild, right? And in retail of fast-moving consumer goods, FMCG things, like one meeting can kind of change the course of a business, right? And like I imagine there's been a bunch of those, like a meeting where – a local retailer or chemist warehouse or Coles in Australia. Um, all of those meetings with those buyers kind of change the course of the business and life, right? Definitely. Yeah, I think we're very retail-led, I guess. Um, I think our packaging does a lot of the work. Uh, we're quite disruptive on shelf um, and it kind of attracts that generation of consumer that these retailers are looking for to bring into their stores. And I think that kind of really worked in our favour as well. And super accessible price point compared to some of the other hard soaps or um, personal luxury items, right? Yeah, I think that's, I wanted to keep it accessible um, and kind of get it in as many hands as people as possible and get them to try it. And then, you know, they love it and, you know, love the values behind the brand. And it's a really giftable product as well. So, um, yeah, that was really important to me. Awesome. Well, we'll be back in a moment to talk how you do go about going from uh, no stores in the States to over 6,000 and the role of capital raising.
Spark is proud to partner with the Sustainable Business Network and the Climate Action Toolbox. The free Climate Action Toolbox can provide you with simple step-by-step guides to measure and reduce your emissions. Help lead the way to a low-carbon future for New Zealand. Visit sparklab.co.nz forward slash sustainability to find out more. We started doing a pikeha. I don't know where I'm from. Yeah, I'm going to go check with the chef. Take out, kids. A coming-of-age documentary series returns for season two. From a Thai restaurant to a dairy to a nail salon, five young people balance school and relationships while growing up in their family's shops. Are you working tomorrow? I go to school. Watch Takeout Kids on the spin-off today. Made with the support of New Zealand On Air. Hoki mai anō. Welcome back. To business is boring, where we're talking with Sophie Cooper of Anihana. So, what is the scale of the business today? So, today we are in over 8,000 stores in New Zealand, Australia, and the US. Um, yeah, with the Anihana is a brand that's only three years old, so it's been a pretty quick, fast journey for those last three years. That's wild. And what kind of products? You've got the bath bombs and the hard uh, soap soap bars and shampoo, shampoo bars, the shower steamers that are the kind of breakaway hit. Yeah, so um, play in a couple of different categories. So um, soaps, um, bath bombs, shower steamers, and then we've got the hair care bars. And then we also do um, solid moisturizers and bath salts as well. Getting to that stage, like in just three years, you started out with your own factory, made it yourself. I mean, doing the manufacturing, like if you get an order, if you've been in a thousand stores across New Zealand and Australia, which is a massive success in the normal scale of retail and FMCG, how do you then go to supply thousands of stores at a much bigger kind of retail order size in the States? Yeah, it's been pretty challenging. I think when we launched in Target, we also we also launched in Priceline in Australia at the same time. So, and it was during COVID, it was lockdowns, so it was kind of trying to make everything 100% ourselves. We soon realized that we needed help. Um, so, luckily, I um, found an amazing contract manufacturer partner in New Zealand um, and then but now we actually work with two so the soap factory in Sheelings uh, and they kind of make the the fastest moving items and then in-house we've still got our own manufacturing pr- um, what's a factory yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot the word then um, so we kind of keep those more artisan ha- really handmade products in-house which are kind of at the heart of the brand so the artisan soaps and our bath bombs as well yeah you've mentioned the packaging being a real star for you tell us about that as it does feel like the slight pop of positivity and enjoyment so when we were our um it was kind of, when you think of a sustainable natural brand you kind of think of craft paper and we were very much the same boat um it had kind of a few fun icons and things and but when we did the rebrand we we really wanted to kind of show our personality and fun and that joyful moment a bit more so yeah, I just, I love the packaging. It's exactly kind of what I imagined. Annie Hannah's a really special name for us. It's my daughter's middle name, who I was pregnant with. Um, it's also my husband's late mother's maiden name. Um, so yeah, it, re- it kind of represents our journey and our family values as a business as well. Yeah, so cool. And when it comes to actually fulfill those orders, like how do you as a business and team manage to scale up that fast like so often there's like the kind of like death the valley of death (laughs) where you get this massive order in and you have to produce it all and scale up all your operations and then land it in store then wait for payment and hope that it sells right because if it doesn't sell then you're in more trouble than you were when you started so how did you navigate that you know that extraordinary difficult scale moment um, it's probably the most challenging part, I think, is the cash flow. We highly kind of underestimated the cash flow problems we would have. Like like you said, you, you, these US retailers don't pay you for 60 days and then it takes, you know, 
you've got to ship it over there. You've got to make the product first. So but by the time you've made the product, bought all the ingredients, and by the time you get paid, it's months down the track. And we're lucky that our product does sell really well. <laughs> so that's kind of helped us. But all our cash kind of got tied up in inventory and waiting for payment. So trying to juggle that. I mean, we have opportunities come still coming at us and then we don't want to I guess we're being a lot more cautious on launching into another major retailer knowing what kind of experiences we've had with Target and Walmart Um, and we want to kind of have everything in line and ready to go before we kind of get attracted by a big shiny new retailer again. (laughs) I've seen you say before that you know getting on shelf can sometimes even be the easy part, although it's no mean feat. It's the selling through that counts. Like, how do you support a brand that's totally fresh to people in a market you're very far away from? And with, you know, maybe a behavior change that people have to use sometimes even, like people don't know what a shower steamer is. How do you get them to know what it is and use it? Yeah, so I guess uh, most of our marketing budget has gone into point of sale um, and I guess the retailers digital platforms um, and that's I guess all we could afford to do <laughs> um, what we really want to do and what this capital raise is going to help us achieve is you know doing a lot more above the line marketing and you know telling people about our brand and our values and creating that loyal consumer base um, so our packaging point of sale has done a lot of the work so far but we know that we kind of need to build a brand um so we can kind of optimise the, the channels that we're in already. Tell us about the role of capital there. As something I've observed over the years of working in and around this space is that businesses like this have very few places to actually raise capital. We don't have a very mature market with FMCG or product businesses. There's a great VC market if you're looking to do 100 times return and you've got like software that you can scale with no cost. But if you're making real products, and those give real jobs to locals and are really important things for the economy, there just aren't really the places to fund heaps of inventory or grow, right? Mm, Definitely. And especially in New Zealand, I found um, there's not many places that understand the CPG, FMCG space. Um, I often wish I started a tech company sometimes. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But it's, I think... It, it just takes a bit more explaining and talking through the vision and what we're trying to do and um, taking them on the journey. And, I mean, there are people out there. Um, it just takes a bit longer, I think. And you've done a number of kind of capital raises through uh, equity crowdfunding type approaches, right? So we, the first one was more of a friends and family round. Um, and then when we did the rebrand from R to Annie Hannah, we, that was through Snowball. Mm. Um, so that was just open to wholesale investors. Um, this one now is open to all investors. So I'm excited because we've got a really great community in New Zealand that has kind of followed our journey from day one. Um, so I'm excited to kind of bring them along too. Tell us about that process, like wholesale you know, basically means you've got to be pretty wealthy, right? That's a bit of a closed club. <laughs> and then going to retail, what does that mean? Who can who can get involved and what are the kind of, um, yeah, what are the terms and goals of it? Um, so the minimum investment is $1,000. So it's really, I think it's accessible, uh, which is kind of what our brand's about as well. Um, so if you want to kind of dip your toes into investing it's the snowball platform makes it really easy you know they do all the due diligence all the information of you know what we're trying to do is there and yeah I just think it's more accessible for people to to look into investing and supporting brands that they love and you're raising to grow further into the states yeah so um this raise will help us um continue to grow Um, optimize our US market. There's still a huge opportunity there. Um, I know we're in a lot of stores, but we've kind of only really scratched the surface of the opportunity. Really, you know, talk about our brand and what we stand for. And then also, you know, we want to set up our own um, D2C because, you know, it's a huge opportunity for us as well. It's a great platform to educate on those products that need a bit more educating about because we've been very retail-led. So having... I guess the more omni-channel approach is what we're trying to do. 
yeah, it's a really interesting um, spot that you're kind of in, and that most often people have to go to the States and they build through specialty grocery or something and they get a couple of hundred accounts here and there and then they catch the eye of a buyer and then they grow one day to be in the big gang. But to be in the biggest ones, the two biggest and most influential, you've then got tens of thousands of specialty grocer and pharmacy and stuff where the fact that your brand's known in those big stores, in theory, should mean that it's kind of an easier sell, right? Yeah, we've kind of done everything back to front. <laughs> we um, went straight into the big retailers. Um, and there's definitely some of our products that are more suited to like the natural channel, like the Whole Foods and Sprouts in the US. So kind of we've done a lot of work on our channel strategy and which products are best fit in which channels. So um, it's exciting because we're, you know, looking at that natural channel now, um, just starting to go into stores Um we're doing a really cool Sprouts trial um, for new concept store soon. Um, so yeah, it's, it's there's heaps more opportunity there for us. Yeah, and and do you talk about your revenue publicly? Yep. Yeah. So how much are you trading now? Um. So the last financial year, um, we finished at fourteen mil. Wow. So fourteen million of sales. Yeah. And that's kind of just scratching the surface, you know, 10% of the possible stores you could be in in the States kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and I guess the growth as well, like the year before was seven. I think I'm terrible. Well, I, I know the numbers. I just, when I talk about it, I get a bit flustered. But I think the KGAR over the last five years is like 86% or something, which is crazy. And that is remarkable. So in, you know, three years of this brand and you know, just six years of business to have that kind of um, re revenue and those kind of accounts. Man, so along the way, like, you know, once it's kind of happened, it, it you know, everything seems like it was always going to be that way. But have there been times along the way where, you know, growing that fast or, you, you know, like having to change operations so much has made it feel like it might not happen? Oh, yeah, so many times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, th I To be honest, I think that, the hardest where I had more doubts was right at the beginning because it was really just me. I didn't really have an amazing team around me. Um, I had all this pressure um, to make it succeed because my parents kind of helped us buy their business and, you know, I didn't want to let them down. And now I've kind of got this amazing support around me, um, people that know far more than I do. <laughs> um, and I get to really concentrate on what I love and what's best for the business. So, I guess now we've got all our kind of processes in place um, ready for the kind of that next step of growth. Yeah. Where do you see Anihana going? So, I mean, this year is all about kind of a bit of a reset, not growing as quickly, optimizing the channels we're in, 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 you know, Australia, New Zealand and the US, and then, you know, do a capital raise so we can really set up for Again, like another spurt of growth, um, starting to look at new markets. And yeah, but we just are a bit more cautious now with kind of the growth we have experienced because it, it was tough, it was stressful and did, you know, it was expensive. <laughs> so kind of having a bit of a reset and a bit, we're a bit more thoughtful on our next step. What would your advice be for people who do see something that they kind of love and think they could get into? You know, like y y there's a path where you don't buy the soap factory, right? Mm. I I think the best thing that has helped me is my network. I well, I kind of always struggle to ask for help, and it was great at the beginning because you kind I feel like you have to kind of do those all the jobs and wear all the hats and you know do payroll and learn all about you know taxes and all that boring stuff. But at least you know it and. And then as you grow, I think New Zealand has this amazing community of entrepreneurs that are just so willing to share advice. And I kind of have this amazing group around me that, you know, and they're in similar markets or they're, you can just ask them, even competitors, like I've got friends that sell competing products, uh, but we're at different stages. So we help each other out. And I think it's such a special thing in New Zealand that we have. I love that. And as a final kind of thought, like what will success be for you and for the brand? So our goal is to create 100 million smiles. So 
that's kind of our big vision and mission. Um, For me personally, I'd love to see the brand in my home market in the UK as the next market and kind of as a, a global brand. And I love that we are creating jobs in New Zealand and having this amazing team and that's a, to me that ha- having this team that stays in New Zealand and we're creating more jobs for people and how it affects, you know, families in New Zealand, that's really important to me too. Oh, I love it. Well, can't wait to see where you take it next. It's kind of mind-boggling to think where you could be in just another three years. <laughs> uh, and thank you so much for sharing the story so far. That's Sophie Cooper of Anihana. Thank you. Gilda, thank you so much, Sophie, for coming and sharing the story. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about that, head along to the Snowball Effect, uh, who do a lot of work with companies uh, raising and exporting. Thank you to everyone who uh, helps make this show happen, like our producer, Te Aihe Papa, and to you for having us in your ears. If you do like what we do, please do rate and leave a review. It really does help. Enohora. From the Spin-Off Podcast Network, that was Business is Boring. Brought to you by Spark Lab. Make sure you're following Business is Boring wherever you get your podcasts. And for more information on Spark Lab, visit sparklab.co.nz. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.